Amen. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you on this beautiful December morning. Let's all stand, please. And we're going to grab our blue songbook and go to number 421, number 421. The first Noel will sing the first, second, and the fourth verse of number 421, the first Noel. Sing it out. Number 421, join in the first. The first Noel, the angel did say, was to certain poor shepherds in fields where they lay, in fields where they Keeping their sheep on a cold winter's night that was so deep. Noel, 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 born is the King of Israel, and by the light of that same storm. Three wise men came from country far to seek for a king was there in town. Follow the storm wherever it went. Noel, 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 born is the king. Of Israel, then entered in those wise men three, full reverently upon their knee, and offered them in his presence their gold and myrrh and frankincense. Noel, 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 born is the King of Israel. Amen, amen. Praise the Lord for our Heavenly Father sending down His Son, Jesus Christ, to be born of a virgin. What a wonderful time of the year it is to, to think about that. And I praise the Lord for that. Amen. And uh, welcome to our Sunday morning service at Harvest Baptist Church. Good to see everybody. And uh, let's uh, open up with a word of prayer and we will continue. Brother Gear, do you mind opening us up in prayer, please? Amen. You may be seated. Turn into the front of your songbook to number 27, The Old Rugged Cross. Number 27. We'll sing the first and last verse of number 27, The Old Rugged Cross. Think of the words as you sing. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. The emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross. Till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. To the old rugged cross I will ever be true. In shame and reproach gladly bear. Then he'll call me someday to my home far away, where his glory forever I'll share. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross. Till my trophies at last I lay down. 
I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. How do you do? <laughs> there we go. See what I did there? <laughs> That's why we, I like the word howdy. You just compress all that and get it done faster. <laughs> so uh, the deer are doing a new thing. They're meeting in our backyard. We have like large groups. Like I, I saw like eight, nine, ten, I don't know, frolicking around. They were like, you know, frolicking. <laughs> and then they went off. So I don't mind seeing them in the backyard. I really do love deer. I just don't want to see them draped on the hood of my car. <laughs> so they scare me. <laughs> and Kathy saw a group too, she had like five or six there, and they bounce around. <laughs> just stay away from me. <laughs> Today's letter is from the Robert Smith family, cheerfully serving on the island of Barbados. Um, blessings from Solany. One day out door knocking, I met Sandy. She and her husband uh, live about a half mile from Rhoda and me. I invited her to church and she came to visit the next Sunday. Rhoda, Rhoda and I visited Sandy in her home and she told us how she had trusted Christ years ago. She visits with us from time to time and she is always a blessing. On a Wednesday afternoon, just a few weeks ago, I was out knocking on doors. I had a goal of hitting 100 doors that afternoon. As I made my way from neighborhood to neighborhood, I had no opportunity to witness and I had no one interested in visiting the church. On my 99th door, I met Donna. I introduced myself, told her of the church and asked her if she would visit with us on Sunday. She said yes. She came and she's been attending every service since. She too had trusted Christ years ago, but she did not have the assurance of her salvation. So we went through the scriptures together and God gave her the assurance from his word that she needed. Donna had been praying and asking God for a church where she could attend faithfully and feel welcomed. And then two days later, I knocked on her door. She, she decided then that I must be the one that God had sent in answer to her prayer. She had been a faithful encouragement to us. Last Saturday, we had a baptismal service. What a joy it is to baptize. It was to baptize little Evan, Evan's mother, Shamilla, and Verna. Shamilla grew up in church and believed in the Lord, but she could not remember a time she had asked him to be her savior. So she did just, she did just that one evening at her dinner table, and she settled the issue of her own salvation. Little Evan prayed in children's church to receive Christ. Shamilla, her husband, Kevin, and Evan have been so faithful in coming. We have known Kevin since coming to Barbados. He is a one... He has a wonderful Christian testimony. Weeks before Easter, Verna, who is 77, had been praying for God to provide a way for her to attend Easter Sunday service. Some days later, I was out knocking on doors and I came to Verna's house. I told her of the church and I asked if she would come. She was so excited that God had sent someone to take her to church for Easter. She comes every Sunday. Verna had trusted Christ as her savior many years ago. We praise the Lord that little by little, our church is growing. And then the prayer requests, and um, he and the, his family were going to the States for two weeks at the end of November, and they found out that their house they rented had been sold, and they had to be out by November 30th. So by the middle of this November, they had to, to try to find a house to rent. And because his wife uh, is having trouble walking, they needed, she struggles to walk now, and so a house of one floor is a real need, and there are no houses on the market here. So I'm... I pray that God had answered their prayer, uh, if I, I don't know. Um, and then second thing was 10,000 John Romans uh, booklets. We have almost finished our supply of John Romans booklets. We would like to order 10,000 more. Please pray that God would provide the, sun, the funds for the personalized covers, the shipping, and so on. And then three, the Sunday school curriculum for the Nigerian pastors. We'd like to be able to provide another 58 sets for these dear pastors. Thank you for your faithful prayers and support on behalf of the Lord's work here. It's a wonderful delight to serve the Lord. Amen.
<laughs> in Christ, Robert and Rhoda, and Buddy and Becca. All right, let's pray for them. Lord, we pray for the Smith family, that, uh, that you'll answer their prayer and give them a, a place to rent that will, be, that will meet their needs. Uh, we pray that they'll continue to be a soul-winning influence in Barbados. Uh, we ask for your blessing on them. Bless in the service today in a special way. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. I don't know about you, but if you're not uh, involved in giving to missions, you're missing out on a blessing. I love, uh, down in my Sunday school class, we uh, read Philippians 4 this year, every Sunday, and uh, the verse that says, I've received of Epaphrodite the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. And, uh, and God says, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And uh, be concerned about God's uh, heart throb, the lost masses of the world, and God will be concerned about your heart throb. And you, you uh, ask anybody who faithfully gives to missions, and they will tell you, God takes care of those who takes care of his kingdom. Amen. Even if it's, you, know, you, you say, well, I can't do much. I can't afford much. Start at a quarter. Seriously, just start somewhere. Start at a dollar. It's just, it, and then slowly push the envelope over the years. Watch God, watch God supply, and then push the envelope and keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing. You get yourself five, ten years down the road, you're going to be looking back and, and thinking, you know, I think uh, in my own personal family, back in 2014, about ten years ago, we, we could only afford a dollar. In our family, the Daniel family, we could only afford a dollar, and now we're, we're, we're able to fulfill a lot of dreams and do a lot, a whole lot more, and we're excited to do it. And just the other week, I was praying, Lord, should we do more? Should we do more? Because I want God's blessings upon them. Amen. So I just want to encourage you. It's exciting, but man, the 99th door. The 99th door. First of all, the, the, the tenacity, the determination to set that goal of 100 doors. And then to, 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 to push through and to the 99th, that's just like God. God says, whatever, whatever you put, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll meet you right at the end. <laughs> Amen. What a story. What a story. God's grace. Amen. Amen. On the usher station uh, or in the table in the foyer, there are some calendars. Please pick up your calendar. And if you have anybody that you would like to give some to, take a few home. They are free for everybody, but please, uh, if you do take some, please give them to the people and don't just uh, tuck them away in your house and whatever, plaster your wall or something like that. Although they, they do have nice pictures, so maybe you want to frame them and, and stuff. Anyways, but that's for everybody, and uh, they're out there in the foyer. Uh, a couple, couple quick announcements. We have our Christmas party coming up. And that is on December 15th here at the church, 6 p.m. It's Friday night, a couple uh, in about a week from Friday. And uh, we're asking everybody to bring a large pizza to share. It's a pizza potluck. So whatever your favorite pizza is, bring it. And we're just going to swap slices and enjoy uh, having pizza together. So that is 6 p.m. December 15th. And uh, come for a fun time. Uh, we're going to have some games and some good fellowship. And we always have a good time. If you could, sign up on the bulletin board in the for you if you plan on coming. That way we know how many to prepare for. Also, um, uh, the ladies this afternoon, uh, you will not have your uh, ensemble practice, so keep that in mind. After the service, the food pantry will be open, so feel free to stop by and grab something. Again, remember that we are servicing about 25 to 30 families, so just uh, just keep that in mind when you're when you're uh, taking things that uh, we we're trying to service a lot of families, and so we want it to spread around. Um, Ann Arbor Baptist Church is having its drive-through Christmas display with more animals and lights and a live nativity scene. We want to make sure that everybody knows about that. They always do a great job, and they're so hospitable. And it's a it's a wonderful ho holiday tradition. They're doing it uh, December seventh through the tenth, so that's coming up December seventh through the tenth in the evening, six to eight p.m. So. Uh, if you have a, a vehicle, uh, just be aware that that's, that's coming up, and uh, you won't want to miss that. It'll be a blessing to them, and you will be blessed as well. They make some great cookies and some great hot cocoa. So trust me, we know from experience. Amen. Um, out on the foyer, uh, on the usher station, there is a, uh, a paper that is an order form. Uh, one of our church neighbors, um, if you know the gentleman down the road who sells the elephant ears at the fairs, he came by this week and said a person in his family had a stroke, and they're trying to raise, uh, do a fundraiser for, for um, the rehabilitation. 
and uh, there's information. Uh, they are trying to uh, fundraise and by selling poinsettias. And so if you would like some information about that, there's an order form out there. It has all the information. And uh, you can pay via Venmo if you have that on your app, uh, on your phone. You can pay that way. They're going to deliver the things here. The delivery date is December 8th. But then also, they have, I believe they're going to have a second delivery date, so just keep that in mind. But the, that, uh, that order form is for one of our church neighbors. I thought it was uh, uh, only fitting for us to, to try to help out our, our neighbors and, and, and open the door for, to be a blessing to them when they have a need. So um, just, uh, just keep that in mind. The fundraiser is for Debbie Marsh and for her stroke rehabilitation. So you'll see the information at the at the usher station in the foyer. All right, let's grab our hymn books. We're going to go one more time to number 426. Let's all stand and sing. The, let's sing all five verses of I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. Think of the story as you're singing. It's a wonderful story. Number 426. We'll sing all five verses. I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carol played, and wild and sweet the words repeat of peace on earth, good will to men. I thought how as the day had come, the bell free of all Christendom had rolled along the unbroken song of peace on earth, good will to men. And in despair I bowed my head, there is no peace on earth, I said. For hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, good will to men. Then peal the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail, with peace on earth, good will to men. Till ringing, singing on its way, the world revolved from night to day. A voice, a chime, a chant sublime of peace on earth, good will to men. I love that fourth verse. Then pealed the bells more loud and clear. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail, with peace on earth, good will to men. Amen. Amen. Whatever you hear in the news, whatever you hear on TV, whatever you hear chatter among conversation, always know God wins. God always wins. Amen. Amen. May our hearts be encouraged. Amen. Let's grab our Bibles at this time. We're going to go to Isaiah. Isaiah, the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 5. I want to thank uh, Olivia for bringing one of her schoolmates to church. What's your, what's your, what's your, Carolyn. Carolyn, that's right. I should have remembered. It's my mom's name. Sorry, Carolyn. Carolyn with a K, correct? Yes, that's right. So it's very important that you say Carolyn with a K. No, I'm kidding. I'm teasing you. Amen. But thanks, Carolyn, for coming. I hope, hopefully you feel it right at home. So amen. Thanks for coming. Uh, anybody else? Did I miss anybody else? Hopefully I didn't miss anybody else. Looks like everybody else is... Uh, Family, amen, good to have you. We're going to be in Isaiah chapter 5 this morning, Isaiah chapter 5. I'm going to ask Brother Tony if he would come and lead us in our scripture reading from Isaiah chapter 5. Good morning, open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 5. We'll be reading verses 1 through 6. Isaiah 5, verses 1 through 6. Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes and it brought forth wild grapes. 
And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I look that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. And now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up, and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. And I will lay it waste, it shall not be pruned nor digged, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this reading, Lord, out of the book of Isaiah, Lord. May we apply it to our hearts as you give our pastor the words that we need to hear, Lord. May we be on full alert of what you want us to do with what we hear today, Lord, not just sit here and walk out and say that was a great message and then do nothing with it, Lord. We know you want us to be active in the local New Testament church, Lord. May we purpose to do that. May we be mindful this Christmas season of those that don't have as much as we do also, Lord, to be a blessing to them in whatever way we can. We thank you now for our visitors that are here, Lord. May they get a blessing, and may we be a blessing to them. We're glad that they're here. And now we just ask, Lord, Lord right now, please fill our preacher with the fullness of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. is born in my heart. No room for Jesus, ruler of all, never a dwelling to call his is born in my heart. Born in my heart, born in my heart. Jesus the Savior is born in my heart. He is no more a stranger. My heart is his manger. For Jesus is born in my heart. He is no more a stranger. My heart is his manger. For Jesus is born in my heart. Amen. Amen. Is Jesus born in your heart? Going our Bibles to Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah chapter 5. As you are looking at the scripture there in Isaiah chapter 5, 
I want to read you a couple of scriptures. Second Chronicles 14 and verse 2, it says, And Asa did that which was good in the right, and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. And then in verse 7 of that chapter, it says, Therefore he said unto Judah, Let us build these cities and make about them walls and towers, gates and bars, while the yet land is yet before us, because we have sought the Lord our God, we have sought him, and he hath given us rest on every side. So they built and prospered. Notice what he said. He said, let us build these cities and make about them walls. King Asa knew that defensive walls were necessary to keep out invaders. Defensive walls were necessary to keep out invaders. This morning I want to preach a message entitled, Lord, Please put a hedge about me. Lord, please put a hedge about me. Heavenly Father, I ask that you please, you would meet with us this morning. I pray that you please help us to look into our lives. And Lord, help us to see areas where we need your assistance. We need you to put a wall around us, protect us. Whether it's temptation or whether it's desires of our heart. Please help us. I pray that you please capture my attention. Help me to, be, to, to focus on what you want said. Lord, I need your help. Help us all, Lord, to be tuned in to what the Holy Spirit is trying to tell us. Help us, Lord, to listen to the Holy Spirit when he, when he pricks our heart about different things that maybe we're letting slide and, or we're not paying attention to. May, we, may our heart's prayer be, Lord, please put a hedge about my life and in this area. Lord, please speak to us. Lift up Jesus. May he be honored and glorified in everything said and done. Lord, I ask that you please meet with us this morning. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Ezra 9.9 9 also says, For we, are, we were bondmen, yet our God hath not forsaken us in our bondage, but hath extended mercy unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia to give us a reviving, to set up the house of our God and to repair the desolations thereof and to give us a wall in, Jer in Jerusalem. Part of the destruction of, of Israel whenever they were taken into captivity was that the, the kingdom of Babylon came and destroyed the walls. They tore down the walls. And all those walls were there constructed because that would protect what was going on in Jerusalem. And the most important thing that was going on in Jerusalem was the worship of God. The worship of God. Nehemiah 2 verse 13 it says, And I went out by night by the gate of the valley, even before the dragon well and, the, and to the dung port, and viewed the walls of Jerusalem which were broken down, and the gates thereof were consumed with fire. Both Ezra and Nehemiah were contemporaries, and they understood that broken down walls of their city of Jerusalem were a sign of desolation. When the walls were broken down, it's a sign of desolation. It's a sign of ruin. It's a sign of waste. That word desolation means the act of desolating, destruction, or expulsion of inhabitants, destruction, ruin, waste. It's a place deprived of inhabitants or otherwise wasted, ravaged, and ruined, a desolate state, gloominess, sadness, destitution. Ezra and Nehemiah, they recognized that condition. In, in their city, and it was all because of the walls that were broken down. Proverbs 24 and verse 30, it talks about the field of the slothful. It says, I went by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding, and lo, it was all grown over with thorns and nettles had covered the face thereof, and the stone wall thereof was broken down. You can get this picture in your mind about this, this garden and this field that had a wall set up. But it was all grown over and it was all unkempt. The slothful man's vineyard, it was wasted because the wall was broken down. He didn't maintain it. If you ever go to Ireland or you go to the New England area, you'll find many, many fields are separated by stone walls which came from the very field themselves. And over time, as they're plowing the field and they break up these, these pieces of rock, they'll go and place them on the wall and it constructs a wall. But if it ever gets broken down, like in Ireland, they use these walls to, to pasture their sheep. And if they ever get broken down, then the predator can get in and do harm. 
The slothful man's vineyard, it was wasted because the wall was broken down. In Job 1 and verse 10, it says, Hast not thou made a hedge about him? This is Satan talking to God about Job, why he couldn't get at Job in his possessions. He says, Hast thou not made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he has on every side? Even Satan can't get through when the walls are constructed, when God has a hedge about a person's life. Satan couldn't get in to destroy Job's possessions because of the hedge that God had placed around everything that Job owned. Psalms 89 and verse 40, it says, Thou hast broken down all his hedges. Thou hast brought his strongholds to ruin. When the hedge is broken down, the strongholds are brought to ruin. If you ever have a chance to purchase a book, I want to recommend a book by John Bunyan. John Bunyan is, uh, is a well-known preacher from England back in the 1600s. He wrote a very popular story called The Pilgrim's Progress. He is probably his most uh, well-known book. The Pilgrim's Progress is the second most uh, sold book outside of the King James Bible in the English language for, over 400, for nearly 400 years. John Bunyan also wrote another book called The War for Man's Soul, called The Holy War. And it's, a, it's an allegory, and it talks about this, this city called Mansoul, as you can probably imagine what he's referring to. And this Mansoul, this city of Mansoul, has a couple of gates, particularly the one that is called the Eye Gate, and the ear gates, and you can imagine what's he referring to. And it's a very interesting story on how, how Diabolus is the enemy, and he's trying to attack the city of Mansoul, and he attacks through the eye gate and the ear gate. I re highly recommend you read, re read that book because it gives you a very, very good glimpse about the holy war, the spiritual war that each person is dealing with. In our text chapter, in Isaiah chapter 5, it talks about this man who built this vineyard and the, the results of what happened. I believe this chapter talks about and represents God's desire for each of his children. He wants them to bear fruit. He was given this message to Isaiah. And he was implying to the people of Israel, Isaiah was a prophet 100, about 100 years before Israel went into captivity. And he was implying, and God was implying that he, he wants his children to bear fruit. Let's go look at verse, uh, one, verse 1 in Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah chapter 5, it says, Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved, touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. It says in verse 2, And he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof, and planted it with the choicest vines, and built a tower in the midst of it, and made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. So one of the first things that this person did to this field was he fenced it. He put a wall around it, a hedge about it. Verse 3, it says, And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem the men of, and men of Judah, I judge, I pray you betwixt me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth wild grapes, brought it for, forth wild grapes. This vineyard did not fulfill the husbandman's dreams. Yeah. It didn't bear fruit like he wanted it to. And so look at what the husband, husbandman does. Verse 5, it says, and now go to. I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof. I will break down the wall. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up, and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. And I will lay it waste, and it shall not be pruned nor digged, but there shall come up briars and thorns, and I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. Because this vineyard did not fulfill the husbandman's dreams, the husbandman broke down the wall and let it go to waste. This vineyard represents our life. And in our life, there are some things that need a hedge about them. This is going to be a very practical message. We're going to be looking at a lot of Scripture. So if you are taking notes, if you could, just to jot down some Scripture, I'll read them to you. But we're going to look at different areas of our life that need a hedge about it. And may the Lord prick our heart. May He, may he stir up in us 
a prayer and a desire to where we pray, Lord, put a hedge about me in this area. Put a hedge about me in this area. Because it's so important. God wants us to be fruitful. He wants us to be fruitful and multiply. He wants us to not only physically be fruitful and multiply, but also spiritually. He wants us to be fruitful and multiply. But it all depends on how our life is hedged about. Number one, ask the Lord. Lord, put a hedge around my, number one, ears. Put a hedge around my ears. Proverbs 1.5 says, A wise man will hear and will increase learning. A man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. Proverbs 1.8 says, My son, hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. Proverbs 1.33 says, But whoso hearkeneth unto me wisdom shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. It's so important that we listen to to, to what God wants us to hear, and God has a hedge about our ears. It is so important that our ears, that they have a hedge about it, because that's how Satan wants to attack our soul and attack our life, is through our ears. Proverbs twelve fifteen says, The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. The one who listens to counsel, the one who li opens his ears to the right counsel is wise. But Lord, put a hedge about my, my, my ears so that the wrong counsel does not enter into my heart and mind and lead me astray. Proverbs 13, 1 says, A wise son heareth his father's instruction, but a scorner heareth not rebuke. Proverbs 19, 20 says, Hear counsel and receive instruction that thou mayest be wise in thy latter end. Proverbs 19, 27 says, Cease, my son, to hear the instruction that causeth to err from the words of knowledge. Lord, put a hedge by my ears. Those, those words that lead me away from the words of knowledge, block them out. Block them out. Right. So much is determined. So much of our thought life is determined by what we hear. Yeah. It's so important for us to, to be careful what we hear. I love that song that they sing to the little kids. Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. For the Father up above is looking down in love. Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. Yeah. It's so true. Because a lot of what we hear, a lot of what enters into our mind, comes through the ear gate. Yeah. It comes through our ears. And Lord, we need a hedge about our ears. What else do we need a hedge about? Number two, the eyes. The eyes. Psalms 101 verse 3 says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. The psalmist said, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. Why? Because Satan, he wants to get us to think about that which is displeasing to God. And he'll use pictures and movies. Yeah. You know, in the history of America, as we were coming through the 1900s, some of you kids are looking at us, old fogies. Yeah, y'all are ancient. Y'all were born in the 1900s. The, the, the music in America shifted through the early 1900s to the mid-1900s. In the 60s and 70s, the rock and roll movement came out. But what really started the downward spiral of our culture was when TV came out and music television started coming out. And they started producing movies with the songs. And they started demonstrating what they were talking about. Yeah. And the, 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 the downward spiral, the depraved spiral into more, more God-dishonoring music and, 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 and just more blatant wickedness just on display. Why? Because the, it involved the ears and the eyes. Amen. And God said in his word, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Job 31 1 says, I made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? Job said, I'm not, I, I made a covenant with my eyes. I'm not going to look and think about someone that I shouldn't be thinking about. Lord, we need a hedge about our eyes. You go, you go to the store, you, you, you drive down the highway, see the billboards, you, you watch the commercials in, in, at, at the football games. Who, who typically watches a football game? It's typically a guy. And so what kind of commercials do they put in there? Nude women. Yeah. It's an attack on the eyes. 
It's an attack on, it's getting to the point where Christians have got to determine, you've got to decide, you know what? I can't have a television in my house. Because it's just, it's just, it's an attack. It's just an attack. The psalmist said, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. We need a hedge about our eyes. If, how, how are we going to be fruitful as, as Christians? How are we going to fulfill God's dream and, and be that vineyard that, that brings him pleasure? We have to have a hedge about those areas. Lamentations 3.51 says, mine eye affecteth mine heart. Mine eye affecteth my heart. We need to be praying, Lord, put a hedge about my ears. Lord, put a hedge about my eyes. Why? Because mine eye affecteth my heart. You see, your heart can only love. Whatever you put in front of your heart, it will love it. It may take some time, but it will eventually fall in love with it. Why, why, why is it that, that you hear stories about this man who is married to this beautiful lady and runs off with the ugly secretary at work? How? How is it possible? Because he, that was what was in front of his heart. And he fell in love with this ugly and homemade sin girl. Be careful what you put in front of your heart because it'll be only a matter of time before your heart falls in love with it. Your eye affects your heart. The Bible says that. And that's why we need a hedge around it. When you allow in your ear gate, and what you allow in your ear gate and eye, eye gate will occupy the seat directly in front of your heart. So we need to be praying, Lord, put a hedge about my heart. Put a hedge about my eyes. Number three, the mind. The mind. Philippians chapter four, verse eight. Jot that verse down. It says, finally, my brethren, what sort of things are true? What sort of things are honest? What sort of things are just? What sort of things are pure? What sort of things are lovely? What sort of things are of good report? If there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. God instructs us in his word to think on things that are true. Gossip is not true. We're not to think on it. Negative news is not true. We're not to think on it. Fear-filled news is not true. Oh, this might happen and this might. Is it true? You're, you're speculating about the future. Yeah. And you're trying to stir up my emotions to make a decision. And it's not even true. Amen. It's all imaginations in the mind. Lord, we need to hedge about our mind. Because as he who controls the, the one who controls the mind controls the man. Understand that. The one who controls the mind controls the man. And what you get to thinking about is what your body and your life is going to, to execute in its, in its actions. And Lord, we need, if we're going to be fruitful for him, we need to have a hedge about our mind. Amen. We're to think on honest things. We're to think on just things. We're to think on pure things, lovely things, things that are of good report, virtuous things, things that can bring praise. Our prayer ought to be, Lord, put a hedge about my ears. Lord, put a hedge about my eyes. Lord, put a hedge about my mind. The mind and the heart are interconnected. Number four, Lord, put a hedge about my heart. My heart. Proverbs 4.23 says, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Even as adults, even as grown men, somebody, some preacher once said that just because there's, there's snow on the roof doesn't mean there's fire, fire, the fire's not going in the chimney. Amen. Right. Amen. Amen. We're to keep our heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Jeremiah 17.9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? We're not to trust our heart. Right. That's why we need a hedge about it, because our heart may try to lead us in a way that we shouldn't be going, but it will justify and it will make a case why we should go that way. Yeah. But it's a, it's a deceiving lawyer. Our heart is a deceiving prosecutor or, or a, one who de develops a case and, and will sell us a, an idea based on deception. Yeah. We've got to have a heart, a, a hedge about our heart. Acts 28 and verse 20 says, For the heart of this people is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they cl closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. You see how important it was that the heart be opened 
to the gospel here uh, to the people here in Acts because when the gospel would come into their heart, they would be converted and God would heal them. That's what we need. That's why we need a hedge about our heart. Matthew 20, 12, 34 says, Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. You see, it first enters into the mind. Then it fills the mind. Then it overflows into the heart. Then it fills the heart. Then it becomes a part of your personality. Then it becomes your favorite topic. Then it becomes a practice. Then it becomes a profession. You get good at it. You learn to defend it. Then it becomes a lifestyle. Then it becomes a legacy. Then it becomes your history. Then it becomes your testimony. And people will either learn from it or turn away from it or learn from it and copy it. Lord, put a hedge about my ears. Lord, put a hedge about my eyes. Lord, put a hedge about my mind. Lord, put a hedge about my heart. Number five, mouth. The mouth. The mouth. We need to have a hedge about our mouth. Proverbs, Psalms 34, 13, it says, Keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. Keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. God does not want us speaking things that are displeasing to him. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Amen. You understand that if you're going to speak that way, that means you've already thought about it and your heart is already filled with it. Yeah. That should be a problem. If you hear that come out of your mouth, that should be a problem. That should be a red flag and say, you know what? I need to flush that out. Because yeah. that's not pleasing to the Lord. Amen. How do you keep your tongue from evil? Flush it. Put, put into your heart, previous point, Put into your heart that which is right, and it will automatically just come out. Purpose 424, it says, put away from thee a forward mouth, and perverse lips put far from thee. God wants us to put away from us people who speak that way, forwardly, pervertedly. Amen. People who, who, who tell double, double, uh, double meaning jokes. Yeah. It could be good, or it could be this way. God says, no, let your yay be yay, and your nay be nay. Shoot straight when you talk. Proverbs 6, 6 and verse 12, it says, A naughty person, a wicked man, walketh with a froward mouth. Words mean something. Right. Words have meaning. And it shouldn't come out of your mouth if you didn't mean it. Right. That word froward means perverted. It's very important that we, that we like, like, uh, like some of these comedy shows and some of these, these things on television, that we be careful that they don't enter into our mind and our ears because they're going to fill our heart and we're going to end up talking like that. Right. Proverbs 8 and verse 13, it says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. And then he describes it. Pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. Yeah. The froward mouth, the perverted mouth. Lord, we need a hedge about our mouths. Amen. Lord, put a hedge about my ears, my eyes, my mind, my heart, my mouth. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 33 says, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupts good manners. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Oh, well, I don't say that. I don't say that around the preacher. Why not? Why don't you talk that way around the preacher? Well, he's the preacher. Well, what does that have to do with the price of tea in China? Yeah, there you go. I'm, I'm, I'm nobody special other than a certain title and, and, and something that God called me to do. Why should you change how you talk just because you're around me? Good. Evil communications corrupts good manners. Don't fill your heart with that kind of stuff and you won't be talking like that. Ephesians 4.29 says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. That's the commandment. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is the good, good to the use of edifying. Does it edify? What does the word edify mean? To build up. It doesn't mean maintain a status quo. It means to build up. Did it add something beneficial to the life of the hearer? And if it didn't, then, then you have to say, you know what, i got to put a restraint on my mouth, and I don't need to talk that way. That it may minister grace unto the hearers. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Don't let it be spoken. 
James 2 talks about there's a fountain of, of water that, that, that at the same, it, it asks the question, there's no spring that produces bitter water and sweet water at the same source. And he's talking about the tongue. The tongue, the, the, the tongue, the mouth is like a spring. And there's no spring in this world that produces bitter water, poisonous water, and sweet water or good water at the same source. And the same as there's no, no fountain in the world that does that, so, that, so should be with our mouth. Amen. He says, per, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. He says, that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace. Grace is connected with humility. That implies an, an air of humility in what is said. Number six, Lord, put a hedge about my spirit. My spirit. Proverbs 18, 14 says, The spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity, but a wounded spirit who can bear? Proverbs 16, 32 says, He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh the city. He that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh the city. Do you understand what the, what the scripture is saying? When we, are, when we do not rule our city, when we do not rule our spirit, we're, 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 we're weak in battle. But the one who rules his spirit is like one who takes a city. Proverbs 20, 25, 28. He that hath no rule over his spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. Do people say about you, man, you don't lose your temper all the time. Yeah. You, know, you know that word temper? It's like your, your, the glass in your car is tempered glass. It's, it's that, that resistant, resistant to, 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 to light touches, although it, it can be broken if you, if you get a tool that, that will do it. But it's tempered glass. It's, it's hardened. Yeah. And when you lose your temper, that means you break down over everything. It makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. Somebody who loses their temper, somebody, somebody looks cross-eyed at them or, or gives them a smirk of the face. Oh, I'm going to fight you. What? Grow up. Yeah. Toughen up. You need to hedge about your spirit. Amen. Ecclesiastes 7, 9 says, Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. We need to hedge about our spirit. Amen. There are so many things out there that wants to needle us, yeah. needle us to act in anger, to act in, in violence and, 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 and needle us. And, 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 and prick our spirit. We need God to, to put a hedge about our spirit. and put, it's, it's like, I don't know if you've ever heard of the, the, this new thing called the knocker ball. You know what a knocker ball is? How many know what a knocker ball is? Okay. A knocker ball, you know what it is, Darius? We'll have to get some and, 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 and do some. Knocker ball is, 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 this, is this a ball probably about, about that wide. You fill with air, but the inside is hollowed out and it has a harness and you put it over your shoulders, okay? So you have this humongous ball around you. And then you and another person, and they did this down at the, uh, in Texas at the teen conference. These teen guys were doing this. They would run full speed and they would bang into each other and then boing. Some of them would end up on their, on their, you know, on their heads, you know, they, that's how far down uh, or high up it was. And they would be upside down with their feet up in the air because, and then you'd have to push them and roll them onto their feet. But the, the thing is so big that you could actually do that and, and not hurt yourself. That's how our spirit ought to be. Yeah. Insulated with a knocker ball. Where people can bang into us and it just we just bounce right off. It's like no big deal. We're not so sensitive. Hey, Amen. <laughs> We need to be asking the Lord, Lord, put a hedge about my spirit. Put a hedge about my spirit. So that the attacks of the world, the attacks of the, 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 the devil, uh, those things, they just bounce off. They just bounce off. Number seven, our body. Our body. Our body. Ephesians 4.22 says, There that ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. Paul is telling the church of Ephesus, that old man, the old desires of your flesh, is corrupt. 
it, it'll rot you to the core if you yield to it. You need a hedge around your body. If you've got a weakness, if you've got a temptation that you, that, you're, that you keep falling for, you need to ask the Lord, put a hedge about my, about my, about my body. What, is, what does Jesus say in the model prayer when he says, uh, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation. You know that's something that we could be praying? Lead us not into temptation. Lord, put a hedge about my, my body. Lead me not into temptation so I don't fall and displease you. That ought to be one of our prayers. Philippians well, 127 says, only let your conversation, that word conversation is not only your talk, but it's also your walk, your life, it speaks. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. That whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. He wanted their conversation, their life. He wanted it to become as, be as becometh the gospel or that makes the gospel look good. Yeah. First Timothy 4.12 says, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in your talk in conversation, in your walk, in charity, in your giving, in, 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 in uh, spirit, in your attitude, in faith, in what you believe, in purity, in your testimony. He says, I, I want you to, how are we going to achieve that end? God's got to put a hedge about our, our body so that we can maintain a good testimony. Amen. Well, there's nothing wrong with such and such, but does it, how does it affect your testimony? What are people seeing? Are they, are, is it good to the use of edifying? Does it build them up? Does it produce a stumbling block? Does it cause them to struggle? Those are all things that we need to be asking. Ask the Lord, Lord, put a hedge about my body so that I don't lead people astray. James 3.13 says, Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness and wisdom. It says, show how out of, out of a good, good conversation, conversation with, with his bodily, bodily works, works with, with the works that he does in the flesh, flesh with meekness of wisdom. wisdom. First Timothy, first, first Peter 2 12 says, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, Gentiles that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of salvation. The world, they how many of your unsaved neighbors have ever been to church? How many of your unsaved acquaintances around the, or, or in your life have ever opened the Bible and read it? You're the, you're the only Bible that they will read. You say you believe this. Okay, well then let me see it. Let me see, it's for, see if it's for real. He says, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, pretty much saying the unsaved, that whereas they speak evil against you, they talk bad about you, making you look like you're some nut job, you're an evil doer, you're some wacko. They'll be quieted because they see your good works. They see them, they witness them, and they have to give glory to God. Because what they said about you and your works, they don't add up. Your works glorify God. Lord, put a hedge about our ears. Lord, put a hedge about our eyes. Lord, put a hedge about our mind. Lord, put a hedge about our heart. Lord, put a hedge about our mouth. Lord, put a hedge about our spirit. Lord, put a hedge about our body. Here's some things to remember real quick. It all starts with the eyes and ears. It all starts with the eyes and ears. It's a domino effect. That which enters the eyes and ears take a seat in the mind. The heart looks at what the mind displays and grows fond of it. Because the heart can only love. The heart fills up with loving thoughts of what the mind has displayed before it, and it's just a matter of time before the mouth starts bubbling out and talking about what is inside and filling the heart. The words, uh, the words spoken create a spirit and excitement about the subject being spoken about. The excitement creates a desire for more of the same, drawing it to seek out more to put into the eyes and ears. The body then is impulsed to take the eyes and ears to the place where it can get more of the same, and the cycle continues. So be careful what you put in front of your eyes and ears because your heart is right behind it and your heart will fall in love with it. 
Another thing to remember is what comes into those two gates determines a lot of what is produced in your life. Whatever comes into your eyes and ears determines a lot of what is produced in your life. Something else to remember is Satan will launch attacks against your walls and gates with the fiery darts to try to get your mind consumed with ungodly thoughts. Why? Because your mind sits in front of your heart. He who controls the mind controls the man. So we have to ask the Lord, Lord, you've got to have a... There, there may be areas of our life that, that, that we don't realize are in danger. And that's where we've got to get our Heavenly Father involved because He can see the areas where we are in danger, where, where we're, we're practicing things in our life that we've always done. Nothing bad has ever happened, but it's in a risky area. Lord, I need you to put a hedge about me and, and help me get those places in line. Help me to know where those areas are. I praise you for your grace and not something bad happening before now. But Lord, help me put a hedge about my eyes, my ears, my life. Something else to remember is he wants you to fall in love with what the mind displays for it. Satan does. Psalms 119.11 says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word have I hid in my heart. Memorize God's word. Memorize God's word to help yourself not sin against God. And lastly, if you have a problematic, problematic sin area, memorize scripture verses that will attack that sin area. So put the right thing in your mind so that your heart can look at the right thing and be directed in the right way. But it all starts with the eyes and ears. Heavenly Father, I pray that you please help us, Lord, in our daily walk. Help us, Lord. Protect us. Help us to live lives that are pleasing to you. Help us to live, live lives that, that will bring you honor and glory. So that the world will see you through us. They'll see Jesus lift up in our lives and they'll be attracted to Jesus Christ. And they, want, they will want what we have. But Lord, there are, there are areas in our life that or we need to hedge about them. We read in the scripture the effects of broken walls and, and, and how it's seen and what happens. And, and Lord, it's desolation. It's, it's ruin. Lord, please, build up those walls. Hedge us about. Please help us. Please point out in our hearts and in our minds. Convict us of areas where we need to ask for your help and, and, and shore up those areas. So that you can be honored and glorified. So that we can be a pr producing a fruitful Christian for you. Lord, I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let me ask you a quick question before we open the invitation. If you were to die today, are you 100% sure you'd go to heaven? Are you sure that you know that you'll be in heaven someday? If you say, Pastor Daniel, honestly, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't really thought about it. The Bible says that we... Something will happen to us in the future. We will either go to heaven or we will go to hell. The Bible says that we're all sinners. If I were to ask you, if you were perfect, would you be able to say you are perfect? You've, you've never hurt anybody. You've never sinned against anybody. You've never done anything wrong. Obviously, the answer would be no. We've all made mistakes. I know as children, we all disobeyed our parents or told a lie or, or cheated on homework or cheated on a test or stole something. And the Bible says that for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God says that when we sin, when we cross that line and break his law, there's a price that must be paid. Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. It says that, that the payment for our sin is that we deserve to die and go to hell. In Revelation, it talks about that liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. If we break God's law, we're guilty of it all. The Bible says if, if we just commit the sin of lying, the Bible says there's a place reserved in the lake of fire for us. But Jesus doesn't want us to go there. He wants us to be with him. But we have to see our need. We have to see that we've got a problem that we can't fix. Being good cannot fix it. It's not good enough. It doesn't even help. The Bible says all our righteousnesses, all our good works are like filthy rags. 
Just, just imagine cleaning some, some nasty stuff in, in, in your kitchen, grindy, greasy, and then taking it to the shower to go bathe with it. You wouldn't do that. That's our righteousness in God's eyes. It's like a greasy, grimy, nasty rag. And there's so many men and, and women and boys and girls who, who want to offer that to God as the payment for their sin. And God is disgusted with it. We cannot be good enough. There is none good, the Bible says. So that's why God the Father sent Jesus Christ, his son. This is the season where we think about the birth of Jesus Christ. And we honor him and we give him preeminence. When we think about him being sent, being born of a virgin, living a perfect life, and then eventually dying a cruel death on the cross, being buried and then raising again. And that's the work that he did that would pay for our sins and be the sacrifice for our sins. So we have to understand that we're sinners, that we're not perfect. We have to understand that there's a price to be paid. If we do nothing for our sins, we have to pay that price. But God sent his son, Jesus Christ. He loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And that son died on the cross, was buried, and rose again in our place. And he says in Romans 10, 13, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whoever asks Jesus to save them shall be saved. Acts 16 says, What must I do to be saved? The jailer says, the, the, the apostle says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. If you say right now, Pastor Daniel, I don't know for sure that if I died, I'm, I'm going to heaven. But I want to get that settled. I understand I'm not perfect. I've, I've made some mistakes. I'm a sinner in God's eyes. And I understand if I do nothing for that sin, if I do nothing to pay for that sin, I'm going to have to pay for it when my life ends. But I don't want to die and go to hell. That's what the Bible says, and I don't want to do that. I understand that Jesus came. He was sent to earth to take my place. He died for my sins. He was buried. He rose again. He did everything that's necessary. And I understand that all I've got to do is ask him for it. I love as one preacher said that Jesus, he wants to give us eternal life, but only if we'll trade with him all of our sins. If, he, you, if, if we will let him pay for all of our sins, past, present, and future, he will take them upon himself and he will pay for them, Amen. as he already did on the cross. And he will, in exchange, give us eternal life. That sounds like a, a, a perfect deal, doesn't it? If you're sitting here and you're saying, Pastor Daniel, I don't know for sure that when I die, I'm going to heaven. I'd like to know that for sure. Then before we open the invitation, I'd like to lead you in a prayer that you can pray to Jesus right there where you are. You don't have to speak out loud or make a speech. You can pray and whisper it to Jesus right there in your heart. If you would like to open your heart to Jesus, he simply says, I'm knocking at your heart's door. If you'll open, I'll come in. If you would like to do that, how about you say this to Jesus with all of your heart? Say, dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner and I've done wrong. And if I die in my sin, I understand where I'd have to go. I'd have to go to hell. But Jesus, I trust in your death, your burial, your resurrection as the payment for my sin. And I open my heart to you and I receive you as my Savior. Please forgive me of my sins. Wash them away with your sweet, pure blood. Thank you, Jesus, for saving my soul, for writing my name down in the Lamb's book of life and securing me a home in heaven. I pray this in your name, Jesus. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, you say, Pastor Daniel, I prayed that prayer. I just prayed with you and I trust your Christ as your Savior. I would love to rejoice with you. Would you quietly, right where you are, just slip your hand up real quick? Nobody's looking. Nobody's looking. If you prayed and you opened your heart to Jesus and trusted him as your Savior, would you raise your hand? Let me pray with you. I won't point you out. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the soul that responded to you. I pray, Lord, that you please give them a peace in their heart. Help them to know that they're your child. Fill them with your love. Help them to know how special they are. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand, please. Go ahead, Miss Melissa. Play him of invitation. The altar's open. How about you come and do business with the Lord? If the Lord has convicted your heart about an area that you need a hedge about, 
It doesn't, it doesn't mean that God is ready to spank you. He's just pointing that out because he, he wants you to ask for his help. So why not ask for his help? He loves you. He wants you to do what's right. Ask for his help. Lord, put a hedge about this area of my life. I need your help. I'm trying. I want to do what's right. But the temptation is strong. Our enemy is strong. He wants to get us to fall. He, he can't attack God, so he attacks us. Ask the Father's help. And the Father would tell the enemy, stay your hand, back off. And he will put a hedge, just like he did to Job. Satan, he tried, he probed, he tried to find out how he could take Job down. Finally, he went to God and said, I can't get at him. You put a hedge about him. Exactly. That's what we want. Let's pray. Grab a blue songbook at this time and go to number 315. We'll sing the first and last verse of Take My Life and Let It Be. Number 315. Number 315, Take My Life and Let It Be. On the first, Take my life and let it be Consecrated, Lord, to Thee Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love, at the impulse of thy love. Take my will and make it thine, it shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own, it shall be thy royal throne, it shall be thy royal throne. Amen. That should be our prayer. That should be our prayer. We're here for God's pleasure. We're here because he wants to do good. He wants to do it through us. And uh, he'll, he'll do it through us if we allow him to. In, our, in the Sunday school class downstairs, we're talking about Exodus chapter 3 and how God reveals himself through the burning bush to Moses. And we're in the next couple of weeks going to get into where God tells him his plan, of what he wants to do. But ultimately, Moses has to surrender to it. And that's what we're here for. We're here for his good pleasure. May we surrender to that and 
Ask him, Lord, put a hedge about these things. Talk with him about it. He, he knows our struggles. He knows our struggles. He wants to help us. Amen. Let's bow for prayer, and we'll be dismissed. Brother uh, Tony, could you pray for us, please?